Hello everyone, welcome to the International Younger Chemist Network workshop series on professional development sales. Uh, my name is Fatima Mustafa, I am the IOSN Conference Presidents Committee leader. I'll be co-hosting this event with my colleague Tracy. I will turn it over to Tracy to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Tracy and I am also an IYCN Conference Presidents Committee member. I just joined this year, so glad to meet you all. Back to you, Fatima. Thank you, Tracy, for joining us and thank you for volunteering to host this event. I hope that will be the first and it will be not the last. Um, so in today's event, we will be hosting a workshop on diversity and inclusion uh, across the chemical sciences, um, challenges and opportunities. We will be joined by amazing speakers from different uh, time zones, different countries. We will be having Dr. Ali Palermo from the UK, Dr. Gift Mihlana from Zimbabwe, and Dr. Ingrid Montes from Puerto Rico. Our amazing speakers will share their thoughts, initiatives, efforts that have been done to create welcoming and inclusive and diverse workplaces in their, uh, let's say, in their uh, workplaces. Uh, after that, we will be having a panel discussion. Our audience are encouraged to get engaged in the panel discussion and ask a question before we end with some closing remarks and uh, uh, introducing you to our upcoming events. Let me here briefly introduce you and remind you who we are. We are the International Young and Chemist Network. It's a network that was established in 2017. It's associated with the IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Its vision is to connect and empower younger chemistry globally. A membership in OSN is free. If you want to be a member, please uh, go and visit our website and connect us with connect with us through our social media platform. This photo of us of uh, the first general assembly that was held in Paris for the uh, general uh, the for the delegates from uh, around 30 countries all over the world. Uh, let me uh, start have our uh, program started with our first speaker. Dr. Uh, Ale Palermo. Dr. Ale will talk about diversity and inclusion across the chem uh, will talk about towards more inclusive chemistry culture. Uh, Dr. Ale Palermo studies as a chemical engineer with a PhD in material science before working as an assistant professor in Argentina, after which she joined Cambridge University. Sorry. Cambridge University, and uh, she worked as assistant professor and uh, uh, as a uh, visiting as a Royal Society visiting fellowship. She has published over 50 scientific papers in the field of heterogeneous catalysis, along with several several influential policy reports covering chemistry at Interface International Development and IND. Prior roles includes managing work in India and Latin America and developing and leading of the Pan Africa Chemistry Network, PACN. She recently led the Future of the Chemical Sciences Initiative based on scenarios of planning to guide the development of the RSC long-term strategy. She is currently responsible for external relations, leading a team working in priority areas, including international large programs, such as Commonwealth Chemistry, PACN, and IND in the chemical sciences with the objective of the driving change towards an inclusive chemistry culture. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, a life fellow of the Chemical Research Society of India, and a member of the IUPAC and honorary fellow of the Chemical Society with Ethiopia. She is working in many places and, uh, and, and, and she has been done a lot of things uh, related to diversity and inclusion. We are happy to have uh, Dr. Ali with us. Uh, without further ado, please um, welcome Dr. Ale. Thank you so much for for that very kind introduction. Uh, it is a really great pleasure for me to be here, and, and it's an honor, really, to to be having been invited here. I have a presentation. I would like to share my screen. Um, I'm not sure if you do. You just tell me if you can see the screen. We can see the screen. Perfect. Thank you. So I would like to um, show my screen. So, uh, uh, sorry, you, your screen has disappeared. There? Is that there? Okay. Now yes. my screen? Yes. Yeah, perfect. It's working. 
Okay, great. So um, I would like to to talk about how we can all work together to make the culture of chemistry much more inclusive than it actually is today. So I would like to start by introducing our strategy, our inclusion and diversity strategy, which the central objective is to increase the diversity of people choosing the chemical sciences and fulfilling their potential. And our strategy is based on data and evidence, has that approach to inclusion and diversity. And this is essential to be, to have the undeniable data behind any intervention that you can take forward and as well to follow process, to, to follow on progress of, of our any intervention. In a nutshell, our strategy aims at increasing the representation of underrepresented groups entering chemistry and progressing in chemistry. But what does it mean, the term underrepresented groups in chemistry? Today, these include women at senior levels, black and minority ethnic groups, and in particular, the retention and progression of black chemists, LGBT plus individuals, and in particular here, non-binary and transgender people. The impact that is deprived socioeconomic background can have in attracting individuals into chemistry and disabled people at all levels. And for each one of those underrepresented groups, we would like to influence change. And so if there is one thing that I'd like you to take away from my presentation today, our uh, strategy at, uh, across inclusion and diversity and in implementation, our strategy is that chemistry does not welcome everyone today, but it should and it will. And by working together, we should be able to achieve this. Let me tell you a bit about how our strategy came about. In 2018, we published our first report, the Diversity Landscape of the Chemical Sciences Report, where we use available data to capture the state of diversity in our discipline. And we found that chemistry is not representative of society as a whole. Uh, there are particular areas where improvement is much needed, as I mentioned before, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and socioeconomic background. And despite the work of many, including our own work, this research has shown that gender inequality continues to be one of the biggest issues in our community, and that the number of women is dro continuously dropping off at each stage of the academic life. That is shown here in this graph for the UK academic chemistry community, but this is not only in the UK, it's elsewhere. It could be a different curve, but it's the same issue. And this is not a specific to academia either. A similar picture is found in industry. Change is happening, but it's nowhere near fast enough. And furthermore, um, at the current rate uh, of change, a simple a statistical analysis of the higher education data that is presented here in this in this graph uh, tell us that we will never reach gender parity in academia for the chemical sciences unless there are interventions that change the pace of change the, of travel. So since then uh, we began to work on a specific research project to understand the lack of progression of women and retention of women in, in leadership positions. And that led to breaking the barriers, our report breaking the barriers, where we identified three main barriers for um, retention and progression of women in academia. The first one, academic funding structures that create uncertainty and unnecessary pressure, for instance, by the short-term contracts that are very common, by the short-term uh, funding for research, but the pressure of teaching and research and so forth. The academic culture that can drive talented chemists elsewhere. And in particular, we talk here about the highly competitive environment. The balancing responsibilities, including care and responsibilities at each stage of the career path. Of course, all of these barriers affect anyone in the chemical sciences, but they disproportionately affect more women than others. So what can we do about this? Well. Well, let's work together to lobby change, for change, to demonstrate good practice and influence other organizations. In addition, a sponsorship matters to anyone and can be a major contribution to progression and success at all career stages. 
So support and sponsor women to succeed. Nominate women scientists for prizes and awards. Unfortunately, nominations of women and by women for prizes and awards are still far too low. Act as a role model, demand and expect flexibility. Be proud of your own achievements at home and at work. And don't be afraid to ask for a sponsorship or mentorship if you need it. This whole piece of work helped us to design and develop multiple interventions to break down some of the barriers that we identify, such as, for instance, the grants for CARES and accessibility grants, where we find we support individuals uh, financially to attend meetings and events that will facilitate their progression in their careers. And an expected result of this research was um, the finding of the incidence of bullying and harassment in the community. And since then, we develop a, a video, which I strongly recommend you to have a look at this. It's accessible on YouTube and our website, where we talk about what means being bullied and harassment and what can others do as a bystander. We also uh, launch a support service where anyone that is affected by uh, bullying and harassment can get some support and a dialogue with someone with experts in the area. It is clear from our work that talented women are leaving the sector before reaching their full potential. And many of those that stay are not progressing at the same rate as their male peers. And of course, Publishing output continues to be an important metric for promotion in academia. So we embarked uh, in another piece of research analyzing the gender profile of authors of over 700,000 manuscript submissions to all our journals, that means covering all areas of chemistry or the chemical sciences, between a period of four years. And gender was assigned to names using a very well established and published method. The limitation of this method is that gender can only be assigned in binary terms. And of course, many authors from some regions of the world where the algorithms for assigning gender to names fail cannot be considered. So that calls for the importance of self-reporting diversity data for actually developing the right interventions. So this analysis gave us an idea about what that the gender balance of our research community look like. And we know that then the proportion of women submitting to our journals is around 36%, which is comparable with other ways to measure what the gender is of the research community at a global scale. Our work highlighted several areas of imbalance across the publishing pipeline. And this begins with the allocation of positions in the author list and the choice where to submit a research paper. We know that women tend to submit to their research papers to lower impact factor journals. This imbalance persists in the peer review process where there are fewer reviewers who are women. And women are in general terms less likely to have their uh, article cited contributing to the overall change challenge of achieving and maintaining visibility in their field. So in conclusion, there appear to be a small bias at every stage in the publishing pipeline, which results in a significant cumulative effect that hinders women and favors more established individuals with the researchers who usually are uh, male researchers. This work led to the development of a framework for action in scientific publishing and to set the standard for driving change within the academic publishing community and to increase the diversity of the research ecosystem. We put an action plan to combat uh, gender biases in publishing and we encourage intervention from publishers and from the community to increase awareness of the issues and to call for increased representation of women at research community, at boards and also in any area where there are the decision making positions. And this led to the joint commitment on inclusion and diversity in publishing, where today we have more than 50 uh, publishers, not only in STEM, but beyond STEM, including social sciences, where we publicly commit to uh, achieve impact on increasing inclusion and diversity in the research community 
and to build standards, minimum standards to where to belong from there. The impact of this joint commitment is still to be seen, but it could be phenomenal in driving change in the research culture. Of course, gender identity is a very important part of our work. Uh, jointly with the Institute of Physics and the Royal Astronomical Society in, in the UK, we develop a network supporting physical scientists who identify themselves as LGBT+. We carry out a survey and interviews to explore the current workplace climate of LGBT plus physical scientists and producing report, which is just shown here in this slide. Uh, and I strongly recommend you to have a look at the findings of this report. But let me highlight two of the key findings from our report, just to give you an idea. Around 20% of LGBT plus respondents have experienced exclusionary behavior within their workplace environment. Around 50% of the respondents saw a lack of awareness of LGBT plus issue. So with that in mind, we developed um, an LGBT plus toolkit around key issues that needed to be addressed. And we created audience specific booklets. For instance, um, for teachers, for uh, practicing uh, scientists in industry and so forth and the lab and so forth. For instance, the one that I would like to highlight is the booklet for allies and colleagues as a resource for anyone wanting to act in allyship and solidarity with LGBT plus colleagues, covering areas uh, such as positive accountability and bystander interventions that you can have. And it is a learning curve indeed. There is also a LGBT plus glossary that you can use in the, it's available on our website. Last year, well, not last year, sorry, in December 2020, we launched our first biennial diversity data report, where we look at all the diversity, at the diversity of all our activities and they are received from membership to education, to publishing, to the grants that we provide, to the governance structures. And while publishing this report is a very important step, in showing uh, transparency of action from the RSC, we aim to report more and better quality data in the future by developing further trust in the community about why we are asking uh, the diversity uh, data in each one of our own activities. So we really would like to increase and encourage higher rates of self-reporting. In areas where self-reporting has been low, we are unable to learn much about from the data that we collected, and we cannot transform that into corrective action. One of the uh, areas in our report that we saw is that there is another representation of disabled people in our work. So what does this mean? Well, either disabled people do not follow a career in chemistry, or either the RSC doesn't engage with them, or chemists do not report, self-report their disabilities. We need to unpick this, and this is just begun. We are trying to review our internal processes and products, and we want to know if they are accessible to all, if we are providing opportunities for disabled chemists or members to engage with us. And this is the beginning of a really large piece of work that we're doing now, right now. And we hope to report on this work by the end of this year or beginning of 2023. So watch that space. The last uh, part of the, the, my presentation is about uh, belonging. So previous research in this area has shown that a lack of sense of belonging, defined as the feeling of uh, membership and acceptance, is an important factor in retention of people within their work environment or their careers. In addition, uh, unless people feel they belong, they are likely to thrive in their, in their profession. So keeping all this in mind, we conducted uh, the first ever study of chemical sciences lived experiences of belonging. Our report, which was launched in, in September, is based on in-depth discussions with chemists from around the world who share their experiences about um, belonging and also through interviews and focus groups. Everybody we spoke to said their sense of belonging in the chemical sciences mattered to them. 
they consistently reported that a sense of belonging in, has an impact on their quality of their work and their creativity and their innovation, productivity, and they contribute to better collaborations. They felt that if they don't feel that they belong, um, they can, this can impact negatively on their performance, on their progression, on their retention, on their self-confidence, self-esteem, mental health and well-being. Questions of belonging or uh, experience of exclusion are particularly important for people from underrepresented groups, as I mentioned at the very beginning. The core takeaway from this analysis, this study, is that fostering a sense of belonging leads not just to well-being, a better well-being, but also leads to better science outcomes. So the report includes the enable, what actually enables belonging, the feel of belonging, and actions to build a culture which actually is, uh, ensures belonging in the community. We are producing a toolkit that facilitates um, developing that culture of belonging, and it will be launched on the Mental Health Awareness Week on the week of May 9th. So another thing to, to look forward in the future. So today, um, we don't have enough time to discuss all the work that we have been doing and what our contribution to make the chemistry culture much more inclusive. But there is plenty of things that you can see in our website and the resources that we have. And I just highlighted a few here, our reports, our data and evidence that is available, um, our videos on bullying and harassment, on implicit bias and decision making access to the support service, toolkits and so forth. And in particular, I would like to highlight the Inclusion and Diversity Fund, which provides um, funding for the community to drive initiatives that tend to increase inclusion and diversity in the community. Last point, oh, I'm absolutely uh, glad, happy, excited to say that on the 17th of March, we will be launching our latest report focusing on race and ethnicity in the chemical sciences. Acknowledging that racial and ethnic discrimination exists in society and consequently exists in the chemical science is essential to actually drive change. And achieving racial and ethnic equality is not just a social justice issue. We know that diversity of thought is good for science, is good for business and is good for society. And there is plenty of uh, data that actually, or evidence that back this up. So we look at the data and the attrition of black and minority ethnic chemists at each career stage. And then we started to a large piece of work to understand the systemic issues behind the race and ethnicity inequalities. So please keep an eye on the communications for, for further information about what we report and what interventions we are uh, putting forward. Finish with this with this proverb, the African I absolutely love it. Let's work together to actually make this happen, to change the culture of chemistry to make it much more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank you for this great uh, insight. Thank you for the tips, for the resources that you already have provided, and also the study finding that you have reported and the upcoming reports that you are working with in uh, the RSC. Uh, thank you. Thank and you. if you have any question for Ali, please uh, reach out, uh, put that question in the uh, questions box. We'll be happy to address that in the um, during the panel discussion. All right, I was told that I was not showing my screen. Uh, can you uh, all see my screen right now? We can see it now. Okay, awesome. Because I was not told not that uh, I was not sharing it, I just go briefly and remind our audience of our program. We will have 15 minutes presentation for Dr. Ali, Dr. Get, and Dr. Ingrid. And then this will be followed by panel discussion. If you want to uh, know more about the IYCN, please, uh, please reach out to our website and our social media accounts. And uh, we'll be happy to have our next speaker after Dr. Ale Palermo, Dr. Gift Milana. Dr. Gift will talk about tools for promoting diversity and inclusion in research, challenges, and opportunity. We'll be actually, we'll happy actually to have our first speaker in this series from Zimbabwe. 
Dr. Gaff Melana obtained his PhD at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. He is currently a researcher at Midlands State University in the Department of Chemistry Sciences in Zimbabwe. His research focuses on carbon dioxide utilization using both chemical and biological catalysis encapsulation in borous materials. He is the secretary of the African Crystallographic Association and the president of the Zimbabwe Chemical Society. Without further ado, Dr. Geft Mehlana. Oh, thank you, Fatima, for the kind introduction. Uh, can you allow me to share my screen, please? I did. Uh, my... um, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? No, uh, we yeah. see screen. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. Is it there now? We can see it right now. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much um for the kind introduction and i must uh, apologize uh, for um i know you can't see um my video i have some technical challenges um but i just want to uh before i start my presentation i just want to thank uh, the organizers uh, the organizers of this event uh which i think um, is very important in promoting uh diversity and inclusion especially in the chemical sciences um to fatima thank you very much i, I want again for the kind introduction so in today's uh, presentation, um, I'm going to talk about tools uh, um, uh, that can be used to be used to promote diversity uh, and inclusion uh, in the chemical sciences. Um, why diversity? Diversity is very important because it is uh, a good tool for producing meaningful research in the chemical sciences and engineering discipline. Um, when people of different backgrounds come together, they think differently. Uh, they ask different questions. Uh, this is actually a, a fertile ground in which we can we can have uh, innovative uh, ideas. So it's, it's very very important that in chemical sciences, especially in our research that we do, we have um, a, a diverse uh, group of people or researchers that are carrying out uh, this research. And then um, so. Just to, 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 to look at the framework for creating a, uh, an inclusive environment, um, uh, I, I have four pillars here where you need to equip the students or, or the people who are doing the research. Um, by so doing, it means you are um, trying to level the, the, the playing field because uh, these people are coming from different backgrounds. And then um, you create an equal opportunity. What I mean here is that you need to remove all those barriers that may hinder um, progress or success of uh, everyone who is involved in the chemical sciences research. And then you manage the culture, identify practices and norms that promote inequalities. This is very, very critical, uh, especially when we have a, a, a diverse people in, uh, in our environment. And then you value the difference. Like I said earlier on, we think differently. Uh, we ask different questions. So the moment we value our difference, it means um, we cultivate um, a ground that is fatal for, for innovation. And then uh, now I'm gonna talk about some of the initiatives uh, that we um, do at Midland State University in Zimbabwe uh, to promote an uh, inclusive um, environment. And um, we have what we call uh, student employment uh, for the disadvantaged groups. Uh, we have realized that they are uh, very, very bright students, um, but because they do not have enough funding uh, to do their uh, um, studies uh, at university, so what the, uh, the university does is that it does create a program um, which they refer to as student employment. Um, this program normally runs during um, the vacation and uh, students are attached um, in various departments where they sharpen their skills um, and also gain uh, financial assistance that will allow them to pursue uh, with their studies at the uh, universities. Um, we also have uh, student funding through the chaplain's office. So there are various organizations which also provide funding, especially for the girl child. Uh, uh, the first speaker uh, talked about uh, gender inequalities, especially with a few women uh, uh, participating in, uh, in the chemical sciences or in science in general. So we, we also have um, organization which it does fund um, the girl child, or even those who are coming from uh, the disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, of particular 
not uh, is uh, the Faculty of Science and Technology at the Midland State University. Uh, the, the, the staff members have introduced what they call um, the hardship fund. So this hardship fund is just the money that is coming or contributions that is coming from the staff members in the Faculty of Science to assist uh, those uh, students who are struggling uh, to pay for their fees. So by so doing, it means we are retaining our students. Uh, we are prom promoting diversity because attracting students is one thing. Retaining students at the campus uh, or to allow them to finish uh, their studies is, is another thing. So we need to, to have that in mind uh, to build an environment that is conducive, an environment that is so supportive uh, for students uh, in undergraduate uh, or graduate programs uh, in order to make sure that they complete their studies. We also have uh, the Disability Resource Center at Midland State University, which, which specifically caters for the, uh, the disabled um, so that uh, their needs are addressed. And we have quite a number of students uh, in the chemical sciences as well as the biological sciences uh, who are assisted by the Disability Resource Center. Um, as a way to promote diversity, uh, the university has been uh, recruiting students from other African countries. And as you know, uh, in Africa, um, uh, there are some countries which uh, use French, um, uh, their language of instruction at, uh, from um, uh, primary, secondary, up to, uh, up to tertiary. And then when these students um, uh, come to Zimbabwe uh, at Midland State University, uh, we support them in terms of training them um, uh, on the language to use, because in Zimbabwe, you use uh, English as their uh, our instruction uh, language. So it's very important that these uh, students, they undergo a one-year uh, English course um, at our language institute, and then they'll be able to be integrated into the uh, chemical sciences or other science disciplines. And most of these students that have been coming out from um, other countries, uh, for example, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Sudan, uh, Botswana, ETC, um, they normally take up um, the same subject, that is, um, your science, uh, mathematics, engineering, etc. And then we also need to um, celebrate uh, cultural differences. And what we normally do is that because we have um, students coming from different um, parts of the world, uh, we have, um, especially on the Africa Day, um, they showcase their culture through music and dance, which we think that that kind of uh, promotes uh, an inclusive environment and allows uh, us to retain these students until they complete uh, their studies. Historically, um, and especially in Zimbabwe, uh, we have realized that um, there are very few uh, students who take up a science subject uh, at university. This is uh, simply because maybe um, the resources uh, at secondary school uh, were not permitting, so maybe they, they realized that this may be very um, difficult sub subjects to do. But what we do is that we provide bridging uh, science programs, which allow students who would have done some science, uh, but who would have uh, not done so well at, um, uh, at high school, then they come to university, they undertake these bridging programs for one or two years before they are actually enrolled into the uh, main uh, degree programs. So this is just one way to increase um, uh, students from different backgrounds uh, to the uh, chemical sciences or other uh, science disciplines uh, at the uh, university. Um, we also have what we call um, the Student Development Office, which uh, provide programs, uh, services, uh, and activities to assist the students in developing the competences skills and values needed to lead and serve uh, in a diverse and changing world. And what is very uh, crucial um, uh, to retain a diverse uh, community at the campus is mentorship. Um, mentorship is very important because it unlocks um, the talent, it, 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 it uh, cultivates the talents uh, that are in, 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 in different students so that they can uh, realize uh, their full potential uh, some uh, people may believe or may think that a mentorship is not uh, good, but let me say that a mentorship is very, very critical to everyone because it just unlocks your potential so that you can actually reach a greater height. So this is um, something that uh, at Midland State University we do offer. Uh, personally, as um, a, a supervisor to uh, master's students and doctoral students, of course, I do um, assist them um, in different ways just to make sure that they feel comfortable in our laboratory setting and uh, assist them in any areas that they feel uh, they need uh, moral support. 
And then um, if you want to promote diversity, you need to engage in high quality research. Um, high quality research, it has the potential of attracting the best students from our different backgrounds. Um, high quality uh, research has the potential to change the world in a positive way. So this is one way you can actually uh, promote diversity by uh, engaging in a uh, high quality research. So our research at Midian State University uh, focus on uh, the national, regional and the global issues. Uh, that we need to address so that at least um, we can make the world uh, a better place. Um, we need to celebrate success. Let's highlight success of marginalized community. I'm very happy because uh, this month is actually um, the, um, the, the, the International Center for, uh, sorry, the Cambridge uh, database or the C Cambridge database is actually uh, showcasing some uh, uh, achievements that have been done by um, marginalized communities such as the black, um, uh, black people. So it's very important. If you have students in your research group that are doing so well, let's highlight them on our websites, uh, what have they have done, what, what are their achievements. This actually uh, will make universities more attractive to uh, students uh, from different backgrounds uh, and communities. And then um, our Lab research practice should promote diversity and inclusion. Um, in, in this regard, I am referring to recruiting, selecting, and retaining a diverse uh, student researchers. Uh, so when we find advocates out there um, looking for uh, students to take uh, up studies in uh, or research in chemical sciences, it's not always the case that we should always say um, um, uh, students of all backgrounds uh, should be uh, or are encouraged. To, uh, to apply, but the advert should actually focus on um, ensuring that whatever they write down is inclusive and allows everyone to do uh, the application. Because if you just say uh, students from diverse backgrounds should apply, maybe somebody does not know whether their needs are going to be catered for. Are there any flexible working hours? Uh, does this research group cater for those who uh, want to go for maternity leave? A lot of things have to be put in place so that at least people or those who want to join the research group or those who want to do the research or to join graduate programs, they are very much comfortable in joining because they know that this is a very inclusive environment. There is so much support in this and we can survive. And then um, another um, way of uh, promoting diversity and inclusion is to uh, do collaborations, uh, local collaborations that's within the country, regional, within Africa, and of course, international collaboration. And my research group has been very active in, in, in this regard in terms of local, regional, and international collaborations. Uh, so let me uh, now change and talk about the challenges. And now I'm gonna uh, shift uh, some gears a bit because now I just want to look at um, the broader picture in chemical science. What are the challenges that we are facing? What are the challenges that are not promoting diversity and inclusion? And um, I'm very happy that the first speaker talked about publications. Uh, so it seems um, there's still a lot uh, to be done in terms of publications when we, we actually want to promote diversity and inclusion. Editors should uh, promote diversity by asking the following question. Who is publishing in my journal? Which articles are you recommending for uh, press uh, coverage? So these are very, very uh, critical. At times, you may realize that this area in my own opinion, there is a lot that has to be done. For example, editors should not send negative feedback from reviewers. That is, uh, as this has the potential uh, to propagating inequalities in science. At times, it just depends on the um, uh, researcher's career, maybe it's an early stage uh, researcher, and then you get some negative um, comments from the reviewers. This can be very distressing. So it's very important that at times editors are trained on what is supposed to be sent uh, to uh, publishers or the authors of manuscripts so that at least uh, we, we don't uh, propagate inequalities in science. This is very, very critical, uh, especially in the chemical sciences, uh, because there are so many incidents where, uh, uh, I mean, researchers, they always complain about that in viewer number three. If you are a researcher, you know what I'm talking about. And then, um, now, I move from uh, publications, now I go to funding opportunities. There are strict eligibility funding requirements. These strict uh, 
eligibility funding requirements do not promote diversity in science. So funding should focus on promoting science. At times, there's a, I understand because the times funding, they want to promote a certain group of people, um, but at times it becomes so difficult. For example, if you have a, um, so many students are in your, um, in your lab, I, 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 I mean in terms of diversity, so you have different uh, students, their ages are different, uh, someone is 20 years, somebody is 40 years, all these students, they're doing their PhDs. And at times you look for funding and then you, then you realize that this one with 40 years, the probability of getting funding is very limited. But do we value the contributions that are going to be made by this 40-year-old student? I mean, these are the things that we need to look at um, and address them. And I'm very happy that um, the American Chemical Society and the Royal Society of Chemistry, these are bodies can actually, we can use these bodies to talk about these things and then try to address this so that everyone uh, has access to funding regardless of their um, um, uh, gender, um, age, race, sex, etc. So it, it's very important. So the message is that for funding should focus on promoting science. And then um, research outputs. At times when we are applications for funding, you realize that um, you are asked about uh, statements uh, on diversity and inclusion in the um, application form. But at the end of the day, there is no tool that can be used to measure whether you would have incorporated aspects of diversity and inclusion in your research. But what research, uh, what our funding bodies do is that they measure your, your success based on your research outputs. These are basically publications or research conferences. And at times, this is not just enough. Because at the end of the day, what you do is that you put a lot of pressure uh, on the principal investigator, and that pressure propagates to the students to say, can you please work hard? At times, students cannot take this. You would have done so much as a principal investigator to create an environment that is so inclusive and diverse. But at the end of the day, the funder does not assess you based on the environment that you would have created. So how do we uh, correct this? In conclusion, um, the scientific community should play a leading role in promoting diversity and inclusion in institutions of higher learning and the chemical industry. We can make use of existing networks such as the American Chemical Society, the Royal, uh, chem, uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry and other parties to engage in sustainable discussions that promote diversity and inclusion. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Gift Milana. Thank you for sharing these uh, initiatives to support the student education and uh, uh, research. Thank you also for addressing the challenges. I hope that uh, we get uh, engagement from our audience about these topics. And if you have any question to Dr. Gift Milana, please uh, write and send us your questions in uh, the questions box. Thank you. We'll get back to you in the panel discussion afterwards. Can you see my screen just to make sure that you see my screen? That's showing. Okay, awesome. All right, so now I'll introduce our third speaker, Dr. Uh, Ingrid Montes. I know also Dr. Ingrid is very passionate about uh, education. It's part of her research. Uh, uh, she will talk about what are we as academics doing to promote inclusive learning environments. Uh, Dr. Ingrid Montes Gonzalez received her PhD in organic chemistry at the University of Puerto Rico, the address campus. She currently has two areas of research, organometallic chemistry and chemical education. Through her research and volunteer service, she has contributed to chemistry, chemical education, and community outreach in Puerto Rico, Latin America, and the world. She has been extremely active at the national, state, and the local level in the chemistry profession, leadership, governance, and the programming. She was the director at large of the American Chemical Society Board of Directors from 2013 until last year. She is the founder of Chemistry Festivals and co-founder and coordinator of the Spanish webinar series of the American Chemical Society and Mexican Chemical Society. In uh, this year, she is starting a new her role as a director of the 
SASCNAS Board of Director. She is a fellow in both the American Chemical Society and the IUPAC. She has received many recognitions in Puerto Rico, USA, and also internationally. Without further ado, I'll be happy to, enter, uh, to uh, have uh, Dr. Um, Ingrid Montes speaking about her um, topic. Greetings to everyone, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm very honored, Fatima, for this invitation. Um, Ingrid, oh yeah, we want to see her. We can see your slides right now. Thank you. Okay. Let me move this. Can you see okay? Awesome, we can. Okay, again, good afternoon uh, or good night or whatever in the place of the where you are. Um, I, I want to address the topic, what are we doing as educator to promote an in, inclusive environment learning environment. I think that this is very important for everybody worldwide because it's part of the sustainable development goals that has been uh, indicated by the United Nations and you, we should move as soon as we can because we need to really um, address many challenges that we are facing now and quality of education is one of them. The topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion has been gaining more attention in higher education over, over the past few years. However, the concept of diversity and inclusion themselves often mean very different things in different countries around the world. And that is the, the main reason that I will focus my conversation today <clears throat> in a more general way than to address a specific uh, maybe initiative in Puerto Rico. I think that we are considering many societal uh, factors and we are facing many problems worldwide. And uh, we need to better understand the role that we should have as academic leaders in developing and encourage and embrace diversity and inclusion. One major challenge is how we respect each student as a unique person, including particular factors uh, as it is the intersectionality. I, I always love to mention this cultural iceberg model because what we look sometimes in our classroom is just the top of an iceberg. We need to better understand what are the factors that influence everyone in our classroom and this is a very challenging, a challenging uh, situation. In this presentation, I will discuss the roles that academics should play to make a difference in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion movement to provide more inclusive learning environments. I think that we should focus in three different aspects: institutional approach and the faculty and each one has a personal uh, uh, perspective. Um, in terms of the in terms of the institutional approach, conveying inclusion and equity can be sustainable only if the practice become embedded in an institutional approach and benefit from the support of all university stakeholders. Sometimes, and it's very common right now that we find that now each institution has a diversity office. And this is very good. I'm not saying the, the opposite, but uh, it's, it's like something controversial for some people because it might be the impression for someone that is completely out of what is diversity, equity, and inclusion concept to feel like it's the responsibility of only those persons that are in that, uh, in that deanship or in that office who are responsible to take this and, you know, to make this 
it's important to engage everyone because it should be the responsible the responsibility of everyone. I think that also in terms in general, teaching staff need supports and tools to know how to adapt their practice and advance an inclusion agenda in the classroom. Institutional leadership play a critical role and they should develop an strategic camp to really address this issue and prioritize and allocate sufficient resources to support sustainable initiatives. Uh, some uh, discussion have been raised in terms of the, the, the best practice to do this is to have an universal design of learning. Uh, for university, this means that more conversation needs to take place around a universal design for learning, which does not mean to find a universally applicable method to teach everyone, but on a, the contrary, to identify diverse learning and teaching methods that give all students equal opportunities to succeed. Over the year, the university design has been applied to a broader scope of application that include teaching and learning activities, a student services, IT or post-secondary uh, campuses, and several methods in learning and teaching, such as team-based and problem-based learning, has proven their added value in many contexts. Embracing university universal design in higher education reduces systemic barriers and exclusionary practices in order to create more inclusive spaces, technology, instruction, and services. And it's very, very important that we address this universal design because when we talk about diversity, many people focus on ethnicity, but we have to really be very sensible to those students that have a specific dis dis capacity or disability, and we need to address and welcome and embrace everyone as someone very special and unique in our classroom. The other topic that I want to address is that uh, as a faculty, we have a lot of responsibility. Uh, what are we as academics doing to move beyond the numbers, the numbers in terms of diverse population and to form and promote inclusive learning of, of uh, learning environments? And there are two major roles that I feel are important. First, become a very active, reflexive professional. This requires all of us to evaluate how inclusive are our classroom and our institution to marginalize individuals. Second, be an informed education. And we need to help to create tomorrow leaders to be aware of and prepare to change the future of the workforce. In terms of personal, I think that everyone has to reflect in their own way of teaching and how to promote and appropriate teaching learning environments. And there are four things that you can potentially do to help to develop your students into inclusive leaders. First, we should address four different questions. Can you help students understand the relevance of practicing inclusion for their future success? As your students move into the workplace, they need to understand the concept of inclusion and how to practice it. You can stand to help them understand this process by explaining the difference between the diversity and inclusion. 
Diversity is what we are. Inclusion is what we do about it. And discuss what will be happen if diverse voices were silenced in your field. By relating it to your field of study, you can provide tangible examples of the importance of inclusion to your students. Can you allow students to see the diversity in your field? Well, that is very important. And that is something that we need and should take responsibility. We should talk, we should discuss the importance of inclusion with our students. We should try to get them um, in relation with some role models and make them reflect also on how are the consequences if we don't have a diverse uh, population and we cannot embrace that diversity in our specific uh, field. Another question is, can you encourage critical thinking that identify and scientifically explore even basic assumptions of the field? Well, I think that we need to expose our students to different experience and we need to address skills that maybe are not part of the content of the course. But it's our responsibility as educators to equip these students with other different skills that are needed to strive in, the, in this challenging work and decide for the future challenge that we will encounter. And Ale mentioned something that is very, very important. I want to emphasize also. Can you foster a sense of belonging in the classroom that allows all voices to be heard and learn? And that is something very important for me. I think that we have been focused in, in discussion, what is diversity? And diversity is the representation of different people in an organization, in a classroom, everywhere. Inclusion is ensuring that everyone has an equal opportunity to contribute and to influence every part and level of the workplace. And for that, we have talked about some stru uh, a structure in the institution and some things that faculty should address. But what is really important is the term belonging. Is how do we ensure that everyone feels safe and can bring their full uniqueness to our classroom or to every place? And I think that it's very important, and this is a quote from Adam Grant and John Mackey, um, that if we tolerate on this uh, on desired behavior, we are telling to everybody that that behavior is okay. As educator in action, we prevent a change and growth of what we really need in our um, learning environments. The sense of belonging is something very, very important. And you can do very small things and do very extraordinary changes. For example, get to know your student names, call them by the names, provide opportunities to share information about themselves, let them be themselves in the classroom, and show respect for different skills, talents, and experience through your lecture and dialogue with the students. I think these are very important uh, things that we should address. And also, as educators, we should be aware of the way that we communicate verbal and nonverbal with our students. 7% uh, of any message is conveyed through words, 38, 38 through vocal elements and 55% through nonverbal elements. So facial expression, gesture, posture, 
are very important and sometimes we are so focused in explaining some specific and theoretical concept that we lose our goal of being inclusive. So it's very important that as educators, we should be vocalized and the way in which overall behavior support our conversation and our action in the classroom. For me, another key element and has been mentioned also in this conversation is the mentorship. I think that we all need to be mentors of our students. And there are different ways that we can support students, but we all are responsible to support professional growth, development, and success in their field, um, which can be very transformative with minimum amount of effort. Sometimes few words are relevant for students to, to, to get the self-confidence and be successful in the, in the course or in any environment. Uh, some mentorship are, are really very, very special and are lifelong relationship. And others just are dynamic that evolve through the different stages of the mentee and mentor relationship. I think that there are some components that we should be aware of when we are talking about mentorship. And we have to have a very open communication and accessibility. We should share strengths and limitation. We should provide a collaborative learning relationship. We, we can share relationship. We can say, for some instance, that our mentees will be our mentors. And it's very important to have a psychological and career support. I think that the mentorship relationship is based on a mutual respect and trust. It's an exchange of knowledge. And it's important to mention the role modeling. I think these are the key elements that I consider are very important to have an inclusive environment. And more important, as I mentioned, to let students belong to our classroom and to our life. And I think that it's always important to mention motivational and inspirational quotes. And this was by Madame Curie. You cannot hope to build a better world without improving the individuals. To that end of us, must work of our own improvement and at that same time share a general responsibility for all in humanity. Our particular duty being to aid those to whom we seem we can be most useful. As a final re reflection, I feel like our tomorrow needs your attention and our attention today. This is responsibility of everyone. If we are to truly want to move the halls of higher education to a new place of inclusion, we need to own our roles and excel at them. As an educator, you should every day reflect on how you can make a difference in providing your students the experience and skill needed to be tomorrow leader in a way that they will also foster diversity, equity, and inclusion to future generation and from there has a sustainable environment for everyone. And finally, I want to thank Fatima Mustafa and IYCN organizer and all of you for your attention. And I feel very pleased to share this conversation with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ingrid Montes, for your thoughts and uh, ideas. And uh, I really love how passionate you are about education and higher education and how to get uh, to provide safe uh, and uh, welcome welcoming uh, space in classroom for students to get them 
uh, pro pro progress and succeed in their uh, journeys. Thank you so much. And uh, now I will turn it over to my colleague Tracy uh, to uh, lead the panel discussion with our panelists. Um, Tracy. Hello. Uh, yeah. So I can. Okay. okay. If uh, all the panelists wouldn't mind turning on their cameras, please. Okay. Thank you so much all for your wonderful and inspiring talks. It was very insightful, especially in terms of diversity and inclusion, especially for today's time. Um, we have a few questions. I uh, had one from Fatima. So she asked about, uh, she usually listens to discussions talking about diversity and inclusion with some others talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and others using the term respect as well. What are your thoughts on that? Can um, I, maybe... shall I start? Shall I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, yes, it, it is true that many people use, um, well, or use the EDI, which is equality, diversity, and inclusion, or they use more and more equity, and respect as well. I think uh, there is a, a significant difference between equity and equality. With equity going a step further than equality, so offers a varying levels of support depending on the needs uh, of what you need to achieve. So to have greater fairness, you provide further support in the individual. So there is a classical example about a, a wall and people trying to see over the wall and they, according to the heights of the individuals who can actually see over the wall. And so the, the individual who cannot reach to the top will need a, a stool or something to actually reach to the top. So that brings the, the equity there. And so in general terms, we talk about equality, inclusion and diversity rather than equity. But the more and more you think about particular very underrepresented groups, the, it is time to start talking about equity. It's a start to talk about positive action, which is not positive discrimination. It's some actions that you need to take to provide really the fairness and the equality that you are looking for. Just in terms of respect, I think this is about culture. You respect others for what they are. And that you know, brings all the things that we talk together about equality, it talks about belonging, it talks about inclusion and the rest, of it, and that's the respect that we would refer to. One point I would like to mention is sometimes when we talk about EDI very quickly, it's just we forgot what we're talking about. So I like to spell it out. I like to say inclusion and diversity because it makes me think about what I'm doing. And, and I do put inclusion first than diversity. Uh, why we do that at the RSC is because we believe if you include people, diversity will come through. If it cannot be diverse if you don't have, if, and then it being inclusive. So the inclusion will bring the diversity. But that doesn't bring the concept of belonging, perhaps. So that's another, perhaps another question. But yeah, that's what my point of view is about that. Sorry if I went too long. Oh, no, don't worry. It's very good. Uh, Dr. Ingrid, do you have any thoughts about it? Yeah, I, I totally agree what Aled has say about the, the difference between them. Um, I feel like these words are are very important to be understood by many other people. Maybe we are not the, the one that need to, to understand this because we are challenged, a uh, champion of this. But for many people, diversity is just a, a specific population, a specific characteristic, and they don't understand what is really diversity. And in that sense, I've seen that sometimes, you know, uh, the word equity is added to better state that we are not dealing only with ethnicity or maybe with age or maybe difference, simple difference, that we are more than this. And um, as I mentioned during my discussion, I've seen that 
many people feel that diversity is something and disability is all the thing and they don't can you know feel or understand that we are talking about the same and equity is very important if we are a female we need something special than a male if we are uh, we have a special disability physical or mentally disability we need also to have the resources to strive in what we want to strive and you know inclusion is now something that is like a slow and for everyone but they don't really understand that inclusion is more than a word it's an action and more yeah. than an action you have to go to different levels as uh, i will explain and i try to emphasize you need to develop the the feeling the sense of belonging otherwise you are not doing anything and the base for every human relationship is the respect so if we ask me for an order i think that respect is the the first one to make everybody included and then you can talk about the other things and i agree with with ale you know you cannot talk about inclusion if diversity if you are not providing the tools to really those people feel that they belong that they will be welcome and they will be really received by you thank you so much dr ingrid uh, i was wondering dr gift do you have any thoughts about it as well um thank you tracy um i i i i agree with the dr ali and dr agreed on uh, what uh, how they have defined these terms um i think it's very important that we understand uh, uh this terminology uh for proper um uh execution or promoting uh, diversity and inclusion in universities because if we do not understand them then it becomes a, a problem there's a confusion all over so i think uh they've given a clear definitions uh of these uh terms thank you thank you so much dr gift uh, on that note of diversity and inclusion i was just wondering how would you convince other colleagues maybe for example or people higher up to include more diverse and inclusive peoples. Those are the kind of leaders who are okay with the status quo, so they're not, they don't see the need for diversity and inclusion. Uh, maybe, maybe I can take that one first. It, no it, it just, yes, it, 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 it just depends on um, uh, many factors. Uh, maybe from a STEM perspective, uh, I would say, what are the benefits of uh, diversity and inclusion? If you can highlight the benefits of diversity and inclusion with the management, maybe they can then develop uh, uh, policies or procedures that promote diversity and inclusion. Uh, for example, I've talked about um, having uh, uh, people from different backgrounds um, cultivate uh, a culture of innovation within uh, different research groups. And that alone will make universities very attractive as to students and donors as well. So those are some of the benefits that you can actually highlight uh, to the management to say, if we can have uh, a diverse community and uh, as well as an, an environment that is so inclusive, this is what we are going to achieve. Um, how much money are we going to bring in terms of funding? Uh, how much, uh, how many students are we going to attract uh, as a result of having an inclusive and uh, a diverse environment? Uh, that's my contribution. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ale or Dr. Yes, I just entirely agree with what Gift said. And actually, there's so much, there's plenty of evidence that actually diversity of thought brings is it better for science, better for mm. business, better for society at large. So, there is, so it is it's just putting the evidence all the time in front of those individuals who actually we need to convince because those are the ones that actually will have the power to make the system more diverse and inclusive. So the ones at the top is the ones that actually need to, to convince you. I mean, the younger generations are all convinced, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I would like Ingrid? Yes. This, this is something that is really hard depending on, on, on the country. But uh, I feel like we can take a small actions. I see that it's a change of culture. 
people feel like this is not important, um, but honestly, if we keep going with the with the maybe the verb or or you know the the, the correct concept, maybe people will reflect on that. But this will be a continuous effort from anywhere, and we should be aware that there are some people that will always will be negative and will be in opposite situation to what we are trying to change. However, you know, it's something that is like a religion, you know, it's something that we should move as a society, as an institution, as an organization. And, you know, if you keep going with all the, the same message from anywhere, maybe you will be aware that something is important, but it's not going to be easy. Yeah, I agree very much. Thank you, Dr. Ingrid. Uh, next question I have is how would you all measure, how do your institutions measure the desirable levels of inclusion and diversity? Um, let's start with Dr. Ingrid. Well, in our, in our case, I have to say that for many of the administrators, uh, we are all diverse because we are Hispanic. And, you know, they are thinking, as I explained, just in one of the major sense. But uh, I think that as a department of chemistry, I think that retention is something very, very, very important for every institution. If you can assess how your students are successful, how your students keep in contact with, with your organization, with your department, how many of them are already in US or everywhere in worldwide, and they keep trying to get more students, to help more students. So that's something beautiful because you feel like, oh my God, they keep with us. And for me, that is the major uh, outcome and so you then you should try to get survey from them and let them know that you are trying to do a change what you need from them to get the opinion to get the different concepts that need to be improved thank you so much dr ingrid uh dr gift any thoughts on uh, you yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think um, it, it can be looked at different angles. Uh, for example, we, uh, issues to do with gender. These, these are issues that have been covered in uh, different fora um, where uh, women have been um, at the center stage to say we need more women in science, we need more women uh, to participate in leadership positions. And um, mm -hmm. my institution uh, at Midland State University, we, we do have quite a number of women in very uh, influential positions. And if you also look at our student population in terms of from the gay child that is enrolling um, uh, to the university, um, regardless of the programs that they're taking, we, we actually have more female students than, than the male counterparts. So th these are some of um, the, the indicators that the university is saying, maybe uh, we, we do use this uh, as to just say we, we are an inclusive, we're a diverse um, environment. Um, like I said earlier on, there has been a drive um, to promote uh, or to attract foreign students from other African nations. So, and at the end of the day, um, we they also look at how many of these students are graduating, um, uh, finishing their, their degree programs. So these are some of the indicators that the university or my institution used to um, look at issues to do with inclusion and diversity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gift. Dr. Ale, any thoughts on your, your side? Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I think that it is very important to follow progress on inclusion and diversity is actually to have the data and evidence. Without data and evidence, you can't really see if you, any intervention that you have put forward has made any difference. 
and uh, so we always look at the data and for instance when you look at women you know more or less you consider in, in general terms 50 percent of the population are women around 50 percent of the population are women so anything that we have in the system should be around 50 percent as senior position undergraduates or whatever you look in industry or what own policy maker so chemists should be represented 50 percent by women when you talk about other issues, we talk about a baseline, and the baseline, if we look at what happens within the UK, we have a baseline, a demographics that actually tells us, well, if 3% of the population or 5% of the population is black, then we should have 5% of the population, at least chemists, who are from the UK that should be black. And, and, and for, that's just to give you an example of the disabilities and so forth. When you talk at a global scale, just it, it, it's a bit more complicated, but you still have a baseline. You, you should always represent an increase in representation of um, the global chemistry community to be equally represented across the world, not by only a few uh, countries or a few sectors, which we talk about the global north. So I think is tracking progress is fundamental when you have the data and you can work from there onwards. Thank you so much, Dr. Ale. Okay, so just for time constraints, this will probably be the last question. Uh, we were just wondering, has there been any impact on the practice of inclusion and diversity due to the COVID pandemic? Well, something positive has to come from the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, we always have been talking and talking about the importance of changing the uh, structures and um, in particular the working practices we were calling for flexibility that will allow allow uh, more participation more retention of women or under other underrepresented groups not only women uh, into the workplace and the response from employers well actually or employers at all levels academia industry whatever well, it's impossible to be flexible, you know, flexibility, working from home is not good, you know, it doesn't. And today we have proved the majority, I'm working from home, I see English working from home. We're all working from home today, the majority of us in many occasions. And of course, there are times that you have to be in the lab, but there are many opportunities for us to have that flexibility. And so the pandemic showed us that we can be flexible, that we can bring opportunities for many to work and to be progressing in their careers. And the other aspect that also we exemplify today is about the inclusivity that we that can that brought in a way the pandemic. Today I'm in Cambridge, English is in Puerto Rico, Gate is in Zimbabwe, you're in South Africa, in Johannesburg, and uh, in Fatima is in Texas, and many other of the participants will be somewhere. And we are all sharing the same platform. We are all talking in the same way, whatever we are. And that's beautiful. So there are positive things which are related to, to our work. Thank we you so much, Dr. Ale. I do believe that many positive uh, things that the pandemic has taught to us. And this is one of them. Uh, however, I, I also want to add that I miss a lot to help people, to interact, to have this warm um, discussion, look in their face, their eyes. I think that that is something that we all miss about the situation. Um, I hope that people uh, can understand that it's always important to keep the best, and the best is what we are doing today, you know, having a very rich conversation everywhere of the world, but at the same time, never lose what is the human um, our feeling, you know, um, uh, the, the, uh, what you are in terms of culture. And I'm sure that I miss Ale to come to my to my home and have a coffee. I do miss it as well. <laughs> as well as you, you know. Uh, so there are many things that we should keep, but there are other things that we should recover back. Absolutely. Very true. Thank you so much, Dr. Ingrid. Uh, Dr. Gift, any thoughts on your side as well? Yes, uh, thank you very much. In my own opinion, I think uh, the pandemic has brought some uh, positives um, in terms of inclusion and diversity because 
I mean, um, before the pandemic, it, it, it was very, very difficult, for example, to uh, if you do not have funds to travel and attend a conference. But because of uh, this pandemic, we now see uh, an increase in the number of uh, very interactive online uh, conferences. So I think in my own opinion, in as much as we lost our friends, uh, our family members, I think in terms of diversity and inclusion, it is actually enhanced um, this area. So I think there are so many positives uh, to take, uh, especially which has been brought by this pandemic, especially in terms of communication, uh, interacting with the different people from different uh, social backgrounds, which I believe um, is actually good uh, in promoting diversity and inclusion in workplaces. If there has been issues to say, um, I, I think um, Dr. Alec has mentioned, you can't work from home, but you can see we are all working from home. Um, I mean, it's possible. So because uh, women were excluded from uh, doing certain uh, duties at work because they would say maybe uh, issues to do with the maternity leave, you would be at home, etc. But now this pandemic has actually shown us that we can actually work from home. So I think that there are some positives to take. Uh, thank you, Tris. Thank you so much, Dr. Giff. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone again for being wonderful panelists and for accepting to come and answer all these questions. You all did wonderful talks and presentations and it was an honor to be a part of this workshop with you. Thank you so much. I'm passing you the baton. Thank you. I'm passing the baton back to Fatima so she can do the closing. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you everyone. That was wonderful discussion. I feel like it's really brought like a sense of community here. Although we are in different time zones, different parts of the world, it's really amazing. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen right now. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. All right, so uh, I just want to remind our audience that this workshop was a, a part of a series of a professional workshop uh, development series. Uh, all of our past events were uploaded in the IUPAC uh, YouTube channel. Stay tuned for this uh, uh, workshop uh, recording that will be uploaded soon. Uh, also, um, it's uh, an opportunity here to empathize, emphasize that uh, the IYCN is very highly committed to equity, diversity and inclusion. Of course, we are uh, a network of uh, younger chemists that came from uh, different countries across the globe. So it's a very diverse, uh, 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 let's say, group of younger chemists. Uh, it's uh, 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 try to promote uh, diversity and inclusion in every mean and uh, at every level. Uh, this uh, article was published by um, a huge group of younger chemists two years ago, A Diverse View of Science to Catalyze Change, if you have the chance to read it. Also, we also try to amplify the voice of diversity and inclusion focused organizations such as the Women in Chemistry, uh, the Global Women Breakfast that we celebrated this year as well, and also uh, the ACS. Uh, also, uh, it's uh, a re really uh, great news here that the IYCN is launching two new committees. One of them is for equity, diversity, and inclusion. We started accepting applications. Uh, we will be happy to have applications uh, from interested younger chemists either to lead the committee or to be a member in this committee until March 15. So please visit our website if you are interested to be part of this effort. Also, we are launching a new committee in our board that is related to science for policy. Also, if you are interested, please visit our website, fill up the Google form by March 15. Uh, one of the great uh, 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 projects that the IOSN has been working on since four years now is the outreach competition. This year, we are um, opening the opportunity for younger chemists to submit their favorite outreach experiment uh, for uh, to, to actually uh, uh, have it published online and receive a cash prize. Uh, this uh, year theme is affordable and clean energy. So 
the start date of uh, submission is March 26. We will be accepting application until May 24th. So uh, please visit our website to know more about our uh, uh, outreach competition. One of the great actually programs that the IOCN uh, is launch is has launched actually very recently, which we were working on, or it was in the, the vision of the IOCN since the beginning is the mentoring program. Now finally we have it there. Uh, this program is aimed to designed actually to uh, support PhD and the graduate student in their um, professional uh, professional development. Uh, this program is designed for six months of regular meetings between assigned mentor and a mentee. They can regularly meet and discuss uh, professional, let's say, a professional progress and uh, uh, graduate school, uh, let's say, uh, issues. Uh, application have been started since uh, February 1st, and then we'll be uh, happy to have application from graduate student until March 31st this year. Uh, please visit our website to know more about this mentoring uh, program. With that, uh, we will come to the end of our workshop for today. Please stay tuned on our social media account and website to know more about upcoming events. Thank you all for our speakers. They were amazing speakers today and for our attendees from all over the world for taking part in this workshop. Thank you everyone uh, for tuning in and we'll uh, see you next event. Thank you.